a real good picture we're getting here of the Commander Armstrong. For every American, this has to be the proudest day of our lives. I'm going to step off the limb now. 38-year-old Neil Alden Armstrong, the first human being to touch the moon. In these eight days of the Apollo 11 mission, man's dream and the nation's pledge have now been fulfilled. We welcome our American heroes of space exploration. Armstrong was an American hero, albeit a reluctant one. He had to do things that he had not anticipated. Are you leaving NASA with any sense of dissatisfaction? He was so hounded so many times. For years, Armstrong has shunned the media in the limelight. Rarely giving interviews, never signing an autograph that could be auctioned to the highest bidder. Now he's about to take a giant leap back into the public view. He's finally authorized a biography. I ended up having 55 hours of tape-recorded interview with him. I was searching for a way to conduct a normal life, but not always with great success. This is his life, told in his own words. I first met Neil in 1999. I knew that he had not done his memoir, and so I decided I would give it a shot, and I wrote him a letter. It took almost two years, but eventually I got an invitation to come to his home in Cincinnati. I remember very well knocking on his door, and Neil answered, and that's, there he is, it's Neil Armstrong. He was not a person that you could penetrate very quickly in terms of understanding the inner workings of the man. But I think that I was able to develop a certain trust level. He knew that I was treating him as more than just a moon man. I always thought this one story tells you a lot about Neil. This was in May of 1968, 14 months before the launch of Apollo 11. Neil was flying this LLTV, this training vehicle, that was devised to simulate what it would be like to fly down to a lunar landing. Let's talk about the accident. Take me through that. I was making a typical landing. And as I approached the final 100 feet of descent, the vehicle began to turn. It became obvious that I was not going to be able to stop it. So I ejected. You consider this one of your closest calls? It was one of the closest, certainly. Later that day, Al Bean, who's his office mate, comes in and then goes out to get a cup of coffee. Well, at the coffee machine, and they're talking about how Neil almost died. So he goes into the office and says, Neil, they're telling this crazy story out here that you ejected from the LLTV this morning. And Neil said, yeah, I, I did. Al Bean tells me he was amazed that shortly after the accident, he ran into you in your office like nothing's ever happened. <laughs> <laughs> that is true. I did go back to the office. What are you going to do? <laughs> it's so reflective of Armstrong. Here's this guy that can nearly kill himself and he just goes back to work on some papers. He was such a focused mind, and he was so in love and passionate about flying. And I think to understand him as an adult, you really need to understand his childhood.
my interest in airplanes bloomed when I was perhaps nine years old. I'm actually speed at the National Air Races Speedway. I lived in northern Ohio where all the races took place. And he wins again. We talked about the pilots, talked about the airplanes. As I got interested in building model aircraft, that's when I set my goal that is to learn a lot about aviation. From the very first time that I met him, he was planning on being a pilot and design airplanes. He got his flying license before he had his driver's license. The Armstrongs were not a well-to-do family. Neil's mother was a stay-at-home mom. His dad worked for the state. And the expectation was that Neil was going to have to pay for much of his own college education if he was going to go. So he applied for a naval scholarship the day that the letter arrived awarding him a scholarship. His mom told the story about how Neil sort of scared her yelling. He was so excited to be able to have a college education. 